I am so excited to present another uh, webinar to you all. Um, New Hampshire Lakes is hosting these. We've, this is our third webinar series and the, the third session in this particular series. The Ecology and Management of Plants in New Hampshire. And we're so fortunate to have um, an expert with us in the house tonight, Amy Smigula from DES, and we'll introduce her just shortly. But just a couple um, housekeeping items, and if you've been with us over the past several weeks, you, you know the drill. The session is currently being recorded. You guys are going to be on mute for the duration of the webinar. We have um, about 80 folks who are, have registered, so that would be quite the party for you all to be able to chat. But um, please do use the chat box at the bottom of your screen to, to um, answer question, uh, put, pose your questions or, or say hello to everyone. Uh, remember, you may leave your camera on, but if you do leave your camera on, people can see you. Uh, please do put in your questions into the chat box as the session goes on, and we will try to answer them. And if we can't answer them, we will certainly save them uh, for the end uh, for Amy, the expert. After this session tonight, around 8.15, you will receive an email from me asking you to tell us how we did. How did you enjoy the session? What do you want to learn about in future sessions? And then tomorrow, uh, Thursday in the morning, you'll receive an email from me with links to this recording and all the rest of our recordings in this series as well. So your host this evening, myself, Andrea Lamoureux, um, and we also have Jessica Sayers, our conservation program assistant. And we may also have Crystal Costa, our conservation program coordinator joining us this evening. So uh, for those of you who are new to us, uh, we on New Hampshire Lakes, we're the only member supported nonprofit organization working for all of New Hampshire's 1000 lakes. If you are on the call tonight and you are a member, thank you so very much for your support uh, this year and over the years. It's your support that helps us do our work, helps make things like this possible. And if you're not a member or, or not a supporter, please do consider uh, going to our website and checking out what we have to offer and, and becoming a member or making a small donation. Again, we can't do this good work without the support of people like you doing your part to care for our lakes. So thank you. Our mission, simply put, is to keep our lakes clean and healthy now and in the future. And we work with partners, wonderful partners like the Department of Environmental Services to pr promote clean water policies and truly inspire the public to take care of our lakes. Our programs, if you know us, we are very involved in the state on the advocacy level with the state legislature as also with grassroots advocacy, working with citizens to, to advocate for our lakes. We're very involved in conservation programs and you may know us through our Lake Host Courtesy Boat Inspection Program or our Lake Smart, Lake Friendly Living Program. It's our new up and coming program or, and through our outreach activities. And in a usual summer, we're out and about during the summer, visiting communities throughout the state, uh, doing fun hands-on educational things for families uh, to learn about our lakes. This year, our outreach looks a little bit different. Um, we are really thrilled though to have started these webinar series. And it's been a really great way to connect with you folks and folks like you um, from the comfort and safety of your own home. So again, we have one more webinar after this. And if you have not heard uh, Scott Decker from the Fish and Game Department talk about fish, even if you don't think you're a fish person, you're going to want to turn in. He's, he's uh, pretty, pretty uh, knowledgeable and pretty interesting to hear from. Pretty, some, pretty interesting fish in our lakes. But First, tonight, again, so pleased to have our expert guest presenter, um, colleague and longtime friend of mine, Amy Smagula from the Exotic Species Program Coordinator with the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. So I am going to stop sharing my screen, Amy, and hopefully you will be able to share yours. All right. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Let's try this. All right, and can you now see yes. the screen? Perfect. You've got right. it. Take it away. All right, here we go. So I have seen the names that have popped in and the faces, and I just want to say hi to everyone and thank you for joining us. I have a lot of slides to go through in a short hour, and I want to leave time for questions. So I'm going to kind of go through these rapid fire. 
But as Andrea said, this is going to be recorded and New Hampshire Lakes is going to post this on their website after the presentation. So you'll have my slides as well. Uh, so tonight I'm going to be talking about the ecology and management of native plants. And a lot of you that I work with know that I tend to talk about invasive plant species quite a lot. And tonight I'm just going to be focusing on the natives. So just to distinguish, the native species are species that have evolved or developed in a particular area uh, over time, and it's usually a very long time, and we usually put the benchmark for natives as prior to European colonization, when people started coming into the country and bringing with them all kinds of things from their native land and changing the natural landscape here. Um, invasive species, on the other hand, uh, are species that are not native to a particular area. They're introduced purposely or accidentally, and they can cause economic and ecological harm and harm to human health. Crystal Costa and I, a few weeks ago, did a whole presentation on invasive aquatic species, including plants. So if you are interested in that, I have web linked the presentation that she and I did down here so you can go and view the invasive species topic uh, at your leisure. Uh, I do want to point out that just because some plants in the same family have, I guess, we all have family members that, that are definitely different. Um, so true for the natives and the invasives. For example, the milfoils, we all know now that variable milfoil is one of the invasives that we don't want. However, we do have many native milfoil species in New Hampshire, which are perfectly fine. So um, we're, we're just going to focus on these well-behaved, perfectly fine natives in tonight's presentation. So on the agenda, I'd like to cover the functions and values of our aquatic plants. I'm going to talk about some of the more rare species in the state. I'm going to talk about the lake basin and lake aging influences on the when and why of plant growth. Some plant zonation and um, common plants by zone. So I just want to point out this is not a full-fledged <laughs> plant taxonomy webinar. That would take hours. I'm going to highlight some of the more common plants that you would expect to see. Uh, and then provide some resources where you can learn more about the range of New Hampshire plants. Uh, I want to say that we have over 400 different species of aquatic plants in New Hampshire. That's quite a lot, given that we have long cold winters and our lakes under ice. So the diversity is high. Uh, so I'm, I can't focus on all of them tonight. Uh, I'm going to talk about management and not managing native plants and why and why not. Uh, and then I'll talk about some of the management options and the costs. I'm sort of building this on a lot of the questions that I've received from many of you over the years about what can I do and can't I do in my lake. Uh, but before we do that, I want to provide this basis of why aquatic plants are so important. Uh, they provide surfaces on which algae grow, and that's important because there are a lot of insects and sometimes fish and amphibians that graze algae off the surfaces of those plants. So it definitely provides um, a, a niche in the food web. Aquatic plants provide refuge for microscopic animals and for fish. They hide out in there from their predators. Aquatic plants like Water lilies provide shade. Uh, this is really important because it helps to cool the water column. And it also, if you've looked under lily pad beds, you don't find a lot of other plants growing under them. So it helps to thin out the water column a little bit and provide structure. Oxygen production is really important. Our aquatic plants provide tremendous amounts of oxygen in the water column. They also take up nutrients and recycle nutrients in the aquatic system. So they are definitely a good, good resource for that. They control erosion. If you have looked along your shoreline and have noticed a variety of plants that form a mosaic of tall and short and very thick areas with different shapes of leaves and different depths of rooting systems, that is basically what's knitting the banks of our lakes and our rivers together and keeping them from eroding away. Um, you can also see that they filter sediment on rainy days after heavy rains start to wash water into our lakes. When the plants dry off, you might notice that they're covered with a film of silt, so they act as good sediment traps as well. They provide food for critters and people. 
They provide great shelter building materials for a lot of aquatic uh, birds as well as animals. They stabilize bottom sediments with their roots. They are pretty. Many of us like to paddle through. Uh, my favorite thing to do when I'm out in a kayak is to paddle through plant beds and like the photo here on the right, you can always find dragonfly cases um, from the, the nymphs that climbed up the plant so that the adult dragonflies could hatch out. You can also find resting spaces for things like damselflies and a whole lot of other, other insects that, that use those plants. And it's just kind of fun to poke around in them. Macroinvertebrate habitat, they provide, like I showed you here, habitat for the insects and also down below in the sediments, um, these rooting systems and the plant structure provides good habitat. And aquatic plants also provide good fibers for weaving and plants for sometimes thatching roofs. Not that we do that anymore, but for some historical areas where they do have replicas or actually old houses that have thatched roofs, they still use some of the plants for that. Uh, a little bit into the secret lives of plants. Uh, we've got some pretty cool plants in our lakes. We actually have several carnivorous plants in our lakes, some of the more common ones. This is the flower of pitcher plant, which you might not see all that often, but the basal leaves of the pitcher plant are the ones that will allow insects to get trapped in there and they'll digest them out. Sundews are also carnivorous and then bladderwort is as well. And many of you have heard me talk about the little blackish or brownish or greenish seeds on the bladderwort plants, those aren't seeds, those are bellies. And those are eating the microscopic organisms like zooplankton and bacteria that are in the water column. So a few different types of carnivores. Exploding plants, uh, this is a personal favorite. Uh, many of you might also play with these. Uh, but this plant, jewelweed, has seed pods that when you brush against them or tap them, explode and send their seeds flying just to get that plant to be able to spread out a little bit more in the areas that it's growing. Um, so if animals brush against it or people play with it, it, it helps to spread the seed. Um, this is a short list, but we do have several plants that have medicinal values related to them. Um, some of them can be crushed up and applied to different wounds or rashes. Some of them you steep and make a tea and drink it. Others are used um, in, in pharmaceuticals, uh, made into pills um, for mood enhancement. Um, one of those is St. John's wort right here. And we also have in the aquatic world, the world's smallest flowering plant. And this is it, <laughs> right down here at the bottom of the screen. Um, not very big, not very showy but water meal is the world's smallest flowering plant. And you're, you're not gonna see any big red or white or, or colorful flowers, that, that's pretty much it. Um, but those are some of the neat things about some of our plants. We also have tasty plants. Um, a lot of our aquatic plants can be used to make food. Uh, in one of my classes, I actually had cattail pancakes, um, but some of the more common ones that you would expect to see our cranberry, watercress, wild rice, um, those are the more common ones that are out there. New Hampshire also has a number of state endangered species that are in the aquatic plant realm. There are 26 of those species. This one here, feather foil, looks like one of the, the otter looking ones. Um, it's a floater and these are trailing root systems and then this part of the plant floats above the surface. But we do have a long list of them here. And we also have a number of state threatened aquatic plant species. Um, those are listed here. A photograph of the reverse bladder wart is, is um, on the right here. So our Natural Heritage Bureau in the Division of Forests and Lands at the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources is the uh, bureau that is responsible for tracking and protecting these rare, threatened, and endangered species, as well as exemplary natural communities in our lakes and ponds and rivers. Uh, they are mandated under the Plant Protection Act to do this, and their mission is to protect and conserve native plants. For those of you who are interested in finding out what might be rare, threatened, and endangered on the town level near you, all you need to do is go in and click this link right here, and this will take you in and you can find your town and see what is around you. Um, also, if you think you found a rare plant 
and you want to confirm that it's recorded or make a record of it, you just contact Natural Heritage Bureau and just report it. And they've got forms that you can fill out to do that. And it's good to document those. So let's talk about why plants grow where they do. Uh, this is a, a tree root in Highland Lake in Stoddard. And we've got some aquatic plants that decided to, to grow right on top of the old tree root. Um, but plants on land and plants in the lake aren't all that different. Uh, plants in the lake also obviously need water. They need nutrients, which they often derive from the sediment, but they can also take it directly out of the water column. They need sunlight and they need a substrate to root in, uh, if it is a rooting plant, that is. We do have several aquatic plants that are free floaters that don't root in the bottom. And if you were to take a cross section of your near shore zone or the littoral zone of your water body, this is the zonation that you would see for the different types of aquatic plants that we have. Closer to shore, um, and this is the real shoreline or any islands that you might have in the lake. So close to any shoreline, you have your emergent zone where you have plants that are rooted in the sediment and they mostly come up above the surface of the water. And this zone will go from shore, so right on the banks of the water body, out to depths of two or three feet. Um, and these depth zones are relative. Um, they can be plus or minus depending on the water body. As you move out a little bit deeper, you move away from the emergent zone and you get into the floating leaf zone. So this is where you're gonna find your lily pads and also possibly some of the pond weeds with floating leaves on them. And that is anywhere from about two feet out to eight feet. Um, sometimes 10. And as you go a little bit deeper, you move into the submergent plant zone. And this is all that underwater zone with the different mixed plants um, that are always underwater. Some are rooted, some aren't, but they don't come above the surface of the water unless they've got some flower structure that comes above. And then as you still move out deeper, you move into the open water zone or the pelagic zone of the lake and you start to fade away from the aquatic plant zone and you move more into the algae in the water column uh, as opposed to the, the bigger plants. So taking a look at that in a picture as opposed to a line drawing, this is a typical shoreline. I believe this is um, Gorham Pond in Dunbarton. You see your emergent zone back here right on shore. As you transition out into the water, you come into your floating leaved plant zone and then you start to see underwater plants. This is a mix of some bladderwort, and then you've also got some um, pond weed with underwater leaves in here. And then farther out, you get into that open water zone. And this is really important. And you can see here, um, picture a, a boat going by or a windy day and you've got waves on the lake. All of this diversity and structure is gonna help break that wave energy before it crashes on your shore. Um, it's gonna get slowed down by the lily pads. And then eventually it might roll into some of these emergent plants here. Um, and also conversely, anything that might be running off land will get filtered or stopped here or trickle through and get picked up by the vegetation here. So this is a really nice, I guess, transitional buffer if you want to look at it that, look at it like that for the lake and the landscape. So some common emergents, and like I said, I'm only going to have a few of each of these. There are Lots more that I'm, than I am showing you here tonight, but these are some of the really common ones that I see in almost every single lake that I go to. Uh, burr reed, this one can be emergent. There is a floating form of it as well. It has white burr-like seed heads. Almost every lake has sedges and over here rushes on the right. There are also grasses that are mixed in. Uh, pipeboard up here on the right is fairly common. It has these little spiky root, uh, uh, base of leaves or bottom leaves on it. And then this stalk, which can be a few inches to a few feet tall and a white button-like tip. Cattails, those are fairly common and easily recognized. Pickerel weed is pretty common and abundant, really close to shore. And then arrowhead, uh, you can see these are arrow-shaped leaves um, that are in close to shore. They've got little white flowers on them, usually this time of year. And again, there are lots more emergent plants, but these are the ones that you can probably find on just about any lake or pond in the state. Floating-leaved plants, the really common ones, you've got your white water lily. These have round leaves with a V-knot shape. 
And your yellow water lily, these are more heart-shaped and oval. Then you also have a number of pond weeds. We have about 28 pond weed species in New Hampshire, and some of them have floating leaves, some of them just have underwater leaves, some have both. Uh, most water bodies that I visit have anywhere from two or three to five or six different pond weeds, so they're very common. Floating heart, this one's tiny, so if you picture a dollar coin, that's about how big this one is, and they're shaped like little hearts. And then water shield, this one is more of an oval shape, and it's just a little bit bigger than floating heart. And then the common submergent or underwater plants, these are, <laughs> they all sort of look alike, so they can be a little bit tricky. Um, <clears throat> we have about 16 bladderwort species in New Hampshire. Um, this one's really common. This is the large bladderwort. And then over here on the upper right, we have world bladderwort. That one is also fairly common. This one has a purple flower. The big bladderwort has a yellow flower. You might also see the bladderwort that has the little wagon wheel like spoke on it. That one's also native. Uh, this one's coontail, it's also called hornwort. That one is a free floater, as are the two bladderworts here. So those are gonna just, I, I sometimes call those the tumbleweeds of lakes. They will drift around in, in big masses. Um, over on the middle left is waterweed. This one has two species in New Hampshire. The natives all ha both have three leaves in a whorl along the stem. Water naiad, over on the right, we have several species of water naiad that are native in New Hampshire. They're typically low growing. They're pretty brittle and they're very abundant this year in particular. So uh, this is one that you could commonly see. Robin's pondweed in the bottom right. This one is um, like a feather frond and it stays down close to the bottom. It's often brownish in color, but it's a, a fairly common bottom growing plant. Native milfoil. We have about six different species of native milfoil in New Hampshire. Most only grow six inches to a foot tall. Some of them do grow three or four or five feet tall in water bodies. Um, so it's important when they get that big to figure out if they're an invasive or not. Uh, and then over here, tape grass. Um, this one looks like a, a long ribbon. Uh, these spiral things that it sends up are the female reproductive part of the plant. Um, so you might see those midsummer, but that's a cross section of the the pretty common uh, submergent or underwater plants that we have in our lakes. And of course, I have to mention algae. Um, it is it's a small plant. Um, we do have filamentous green algae, uh, very abundant in New Hampshire most summers. This is the one that looks a lot like a, a cloud, or if you want to be imaginative, cotton candy. And it can be a brilliant green color, or if it's starting to die off, it can fade to a light green or sometimes a brownish color. This is the one that is not harmful. We're not worried about this one. It, it can be unsightly, it can be scary, but it does happen in lakes that are across the spectrum of low nutrient to high nutrient. It's just a normal summer occurrence. Uh, and then across the bottom here are the ones that you really should look out for. Um, cyanobacteria are native. They're very common. They're present in almost all water bodies, but usually in really low number. Uh, but when they start to bloom, and these are all pictures of different types of blooms, this one over here is the classic look of the paint spill on the lake. Um, that's one that we get reported often. This one over here is more of the surface scum and the wind and the waves will push it over towards shore and it will tend to pile up on shore. And then if you have a really bad algae bloom, you will see the whole lake turn almost a pea soup green color and then sometimes still have a, a little scum to the surface. So the cyanobacteria are the ones that we're really worried about. And if you see any type of scum, please report that. Um, the filamentous green algae, which is okay, we're not really worried about. Uh, it is not harmful. So let's take a look at some of the, the different growths of plants that we might see in the different stages of lakes. So many of you who are familiar with lakes are familiar with uh, lake aging or lake eutrophication is the official name for it. And we have three distinct categories of lakes, but of course there are the in-between or the transitional categories of our lakes. Starting with oligotrophic lakes, these are the clean, clear, low nutrient lakes, low amounts of algae, usually trout fisheries, 
and then they have very sparse vegetation. So you're probably not going to find a lot of aquatic plant growth in those lakes. Down here in the eutrophic lakes at the other end of the spectrum, you're going to find that it's a little shallower, a little muckier. You're going to have a little bit more nutrient content and you're going to have more of a dense vegetation category, more diversity and more density of plants. The mesotrophic category is in the middle, as you would expect. It's got characteristics of both oligotrophic and eutrophic. So I'm just going to go through a couple different pictures. These are, these are sort of sterile diagrams, but uh, these photos here give you a better idea of oligotrophic with less plant growth. Mesotrophic with a little bit more diversity and a little bit more plant growth. And then eutrophic with a lot of plant growth. Um, and lakes tend to follow a progression. And over time, lakes will start to accumulate more plant growth. It's just a natural process. But it is something that, that ultimately will happen. Another factor that influences plant growth is the shape of the lake basin. If you have, a, like on the left here, a lake basin that's deep, where the steep-sided slopes drop off very quickly to the bottom of the lake, that is something that would probably have a little less likelihood of having a lot of plant growth in it. Over on the right hand side, we have a lake that is shallower and there are more gradually sloping uh, sides to the lake. So there's more habitat where the plants could, could inhabit. So taking a look at the depth map of a lake and all of you can go and find your favorite lake here, um, the DES Lake Mapper. I provided a link, but you can Google it and you can find depth maps and ultimately plant maps for each of the lakes in the state that are greater than 10 acres in size. So this is an example of a lake that's deeper. These are 20 foot depth contours on the lake that you can see here. And uh, obviously a deep lake, 100 feet, 120 feet at the deepest. But the significant thing to look at here is that these depth lines are very close together, which means that the, the lake sides are very steep. It drops off deep very quickly. There are only a couple spots on this lake where it's fairly shallow, and you can see that over here on the left. Now, if I were to add the plant map into this, and this is the plant map, these symbols here indicate the plants that were mapped in this lake, you can see that the plants obviously coincide with where the lake is the shallowest and the plants can more easily root in those zones. Uh, what you would expect to see from a lake like that would be vegetation close to shore and then tapering off as you get out deeper in the lake. Contrast that with a shallow basin lake. This lake only gets to 10 feet deep. Most of the lake is five feet deep or less, which means sunlight can penetrate to most of the lake bottom. If you add the plant map, almost expectedly you see that the aquatic plants are over much of the lake bottom except for where that, that deep spot over here was. And this is actually photographs from this particular lake. And you can see that the vegetation is in fact fairly abundant, uh, close to shore. But then if you look down that lake, you can see that there is abundant vegetation across most of the lake in this shallow lake basin. There are always, in any water body, exceptions. Um, this lake has a very shallow shelf, but look at the substrate on it. It's mostly sandy and mostly rocky, so it's really hard for vegetation. You can see a little bit right there for vegetation to grow in an area like this. Over time it will, but uh, it, it's just not conducive right now. So one of the really important things is to have realistic expectations for what a water body is going to look like. If you live on a shallow lake where sunlight penetrates to the bottom, <clears throat> you're going to mostly have a lot of vegetation. Um, and it's probably going to be a lake that's more suitable for paddling, bird watching, warm water fishing, um, just due to the sheer density of the vegetation. On other lakes where there's motor boating and sailing and swimming and possibly a cold water fishery where there's very few plants, um, it's a completely different type of system. Um, you might not enjoy bass fishing as much as you would on a water body like this. Um, so, you know, it, you just have to have realistic expectations about the age of your water body. And I mean, all of our water bodies were formed 
13,000 years ago when the glaciers last went through New Hampshire, but how they age and where they are on the landscape is going to affect what they look like. <clears throat> so <laughs> this is what I tend to hear a lot. Um, there, there are a lot of concerns that we hear about aquatic plants in water bodies. Um, they're everywhere, there are more every year, they're slimy, uh, there are bugs in them. Um, and these are all definitely valid concerns that people have when it comes to aquatic plants in their water bodies. Um, the important thing to remember is that the plants aren't harmful and there's really nothing in our lakes that is really gonna hurt us. Um, so it's, it's more of a subjective perspective, but it does, it does take, there is value in having the discussion about when plants become weeds and how much is too much and is there a rating to determine when plants become bad uh, and what does that depend on. So in New Hampshire and in other states, when we're assessing our water bodies, we, we assess based on established surface water quality standards. These are categories of um, nutrients or um, contaminants that have known standards. And we compare our surface water quality data to these standards and see if they support designated uses. And designated uses are simply categories of our lakes that we look at. Um, I've listed, listed them here. Um, aquatic life designated uses, primary contact recreation, this is more like swimming. Secondary contact recreation, this is probably more like boating or fishing that involves minimal contact with the water body. And then wildlife designated uses, and this is essentially habitat. So these are the categories of lakes that we, uh, of characteristics of lakes that we look at when we assess them. And like I said, we have known standards for a lot of things in our water quality standards. There are currently no thresholds or numeric criteria for native aquatic plants. So we can't run through these designated uses and say that there's a number for plant density that would um, put us in a violation of one of these designated uses. Um, so typically that would be the case for phosphorus or for conductivity or some other parameter, but just not for aquatic plants. So for native aquatic plants, it's more of a sub subjective determination, and that's usually driven by local entities. So New Hampshire isn't going to impair a water body because of a plant rating. Um, for state listed exotic aquatic plants, we do list a water body as impaired for presence or absence of a state listed invasive, but we do not for native plants. We do have a rating system, um, and this is in our lake assessments. Uh, when we go out and we do plant surveys on a lake that we're assessing, we will identify the plant and map it like the maps that I just showed you, and we'll put a rating with it. So pickerel weed in Lake Wipwas was common, white water lily was common, abundant. And then each of those will get a ranking and then the lake overall will get a rating for plant abundance. And that's qualitative. It doesn't have a number assigned to it. Uh, and then we have definitions for these different rating categories. And I'm not gonna go through them all now, but again, they're qualitative and they just describe from sparse to very abundant in a water body. We do use those for determining trophic classification like oligotrophic or mesotrophic, but they don't go into our, um, our assessments. So a little bit about when, why, and how, and how not to manage um, if the decision is to manage native plants. Um, some of the, we're gonna start first with some of the arguments against, uh, against native plant management, um, just to go through them. Um, so as I've mentioned, native aquatic vegetation is part of a natural system, um, it's normal. Um, one consideration is that our lakes aren't swimming pools. They're not intended to be sterile plant algae free systems. They're natural evolving aging systems. Uh, natural aquatic vegetation provides the functional values that I talked about at the beginning of this presentation. Uh, and one of the really important things um, that, that's a little scary when it comes to managing a lot of native plants in a water body, especially for shallow and smaller lakes, is something called alternate stable states. 
And what that means is that lakes are typically going to be dominated by either plants or algae. You don't typically have a great balance between the two. And it's a dominance factor. Certainly all of our lakes have algae and all of them have plants, but there's going to be a dominance of one or the other. And that's because something is going to use the nutrients that are in our lake, so lakes. So if you were to remove a lot of plant growth from your lake, those nutrients are still going to be there and algae are most likely going to take those up because the plants aren't taking them up to keep the nutrients low. So you could move to an algal dominated system that's less clear um, and turbid because of algae as opposed to a clearer lake that has plant growth and a little bit of algae. So it's, it's a delicate balance there. And then um, management may also open up habitat for invasive species because invasives like disturbance. And if you fish, uh, you might want to preserve the native plants. This is a listing of the plant cover that each of these species tends to favor for habitat. Um, not a, a lot of people do like to fish for bluegill or perch and eat them. Um, there are a whole lot of bass fishing people out there. Um, bass prefer 40 to 60% plant cover, which is a fairly high amount of plant cover. And water bodies with northern pike tend to have a lot of plant cover because that fish species does, does require a lot of plants, uh, more than 80% cover in fact. So um, fisheries do need plants. If you bird hunt or watch, uh, preserving native plants is important for food, for waterfowl. Um, they, they use the, the the plants for food or um, invertebrates that are living on the food, so they'll eat the bugs in the, in the plants. Uh, shelter, a lot of waterfowl um, and other organisms will use nesting material made out of plants uh, or use the plants for camouflage and protection. Uh, and also, I already mentioned all of these. These are more of the functional values of the water body. They're very important for preserving water quality in the lake. But if you do opt to pursue management, there are several things to be aware of. Uh, and this is delving into a completely different realm than biology, ecology, but it's really important to go over because I know a lot of people have asked, well, can I cut the plants that are growing in front of my beach or around my dock? Or can I, can I mow them over? Can I dig them out? And, and I just want to go through some of these. Um, I've, I've even had some concerns about people self-dosing with herbicides uh, as well on some lakes that I've surveyed. So the rule of thumb is that permits are almost always required. So for physical mechanical removal of plants in a lake, that would fall to the Wetlands Bureau for issuing a permit. Uh, and I provided their phone number here. They have an inspector of the day that is available all day, every day. It's a different person every day. And they field questions from people that aren't sure if they need a permit or not. So you can chat with them. The Wetlands Bureau has jurisdiction from the top of the bank, sloping down into the lake and the lake bottom. So anything in the banks and borders of water bodies is jurisdictional. So you may own the property that you have a house on, but the bank and the slope and the lake bed are jurisdictional areas. Uh, for herbicide treatment, um, permits are always required. So that's an easy one. Um, you need a permit from the Department of Agriculture Pesticide Control Division, and the treatment needs to be done by a state licensed herbicide applicator. And I did provide the contact information for the one company that does work in our region. So if you have any questions, you can contact them. These are the different management methods that are available. Physical control, this could include hand picking, raking, cutting. Um, there are these things called weed rollers that are out there. Um, placement of benthic barriers and drawdown. Um, so those are some of the physical methods. A lot of people defer, default to drawdown because it's cheap and fairly easy. Um, it's not a scientific control mechanism. Um, you don't always get what you expect, um, but it is something that, that people do try from time to time. Mechanical control includes cutting or digging. Um, this is a hydro raker. It's basically a backhoe with a York rake on it, and they uh, reach in eight to 10 feet deep, and they remove the roots and the plants from the lake. 
And mechanical harvesting is like an aquatic lawnmower. It just chops off the plants and collects it on a conveyor belt and removes it from the lake. Diver assisted suction harvesting. This is basically a diver hand removing plants and using um, a, like a gold sluicing um, platform to pull the plants out of the water. And then herbicide treatment is usually done by um, a licensed applicator on a boat. So just taking a look at a couple of the wetlands rules to address some of the questions that come up about what you can do in your shorefront or lakefront area. And it's fairly limited. Um, I provided at the bottom of this slide and a couple of the other slides links right to the wetlands rules. Um, this one talks about uh, any work to maintain access to the existing legal beach, docking facility, public boat ramp, or community swim area. So this pretty much covers all of the shorefront areas for most houses or beaches on the lake. Um, you need to show that you minimize water quality impacts, you protect nesting and other critical habitats. Um, you can't damage the root system. So digging these out um, really starts to constitute a dredge with, which gets into a more heavy hitting permit requirement. Um, and then they've got thresholds for square feet of impact. Um, these activities definitely need a permit and they will either be a minimum impact, a minor or a major impact project. And that's where talking to the Wetlands Bureau is important to make sure that you submit a permit application if you need to. Um, some of these might be really painless, like if you want to just rake up some vegetation or cut some vegetation just to open a path to deeper water, it just might be a minimum impact project and it could be expedited, but dredging or hydro raking and things like that are much more involved. So what can you do without a permit in your lake? Um, again, it's really important to ask when in doubt. Um, there are a lot of nuances when it comes to state laws and rules. And this talk just includes a general overview. The wetlands um, inspectors are really the experts here. And I encourage you to chat with them about it. I, I actually had to go back and forth with some of the inspectors just to be sure that I had this information correct because there are, like I said, a lot of nuances. So these are the next couple slides are things that supposedly you can do without a permit, but there are still a lot of guidelines that need to be met if you're doing any of these. So mowing, cutting um, a vegetation in a wet meadow, red maple swamp, hemlock swamp, or pine swamp, which doesn't define a lake, but there is a nuance here. Um, all of these activities can be done without a permit as long as you don't remove the uh, roots of the vegetation. Um, this is for more of the, the woody forested wetland. Um, the ground needs to be frozen. But here, this nuance right here, um, the project um, can't happen in these habitats and it, this word marsh. I've got a definition on the next page of marsh. This word being in here also starts to, to rope in lake systems. Um, because they define marshes that have um, herbaceous vegetation, which lakes do, and lakes are a wetland, they're a deep wetland. Uh, so this is something that doesn't let you cut the vegetation or mow the vegetation in the lake. Um, another question that comes up often is, can I put a fabric barrier down on the lake bottom to, to clean up my shore frontage? And the answer is, for an exotic aquatic plant project with state approval, yes. Um, up to 10,000 square feet. However, it doesn't say native aquatic vegetation. It's only for exotic. So for native vegetation management or muck on the lake bottom, you would need a permit for a benthic barrier. And then here's that definition of marsh. It includes uh, a wetland that distinguishes itself by soft stemmed herbaceous plants. They list grasses, rushes, and sedges here, um, but it definitely is lake bottom. And I had that confirmed by the Wetlands Bureau. So you're very limited in what you can do without a permit um, from wetlands for raking or digging or cutting on the shorefront and even cutting. And then these are some other things that you can do. Um, you can hand rake leaves and other organic debris from the lake shoreline or lake bed um, if the conditions are drawn down. Um, so if the lake is down and the bottom is exposed, you can rake the lake bed. However, you can't disturb, disturb the roots. 
and raking is gonna be limited to no larger than 900 square feet. So if you are on an area of the lake where you have a ton of oak leaves or other leaves that fall into the lake that don't decompose and you do a drawdown, you can certainly rake those out and no permit is needed for those as long as you're not pulling up root systems too. Um, and then also I stuck this in here because it involves plants, but you can plant uh, non-invasive non plants um, to enhance wetlands um, in lakes. We don't encourage it, but if you're doing some type of restoration project, you certainly can. And just one more, one more disclaimer, if I can. Um, when in doubt, ask the Wetlands Bureau. I just wanted to provide you with some costs for management. Um, hand, hand harvesting by a diver is $50 to $100 per hour. Um, Diver-assisted suction harvesting, about $800 to $1,000 a day. Benthic barrier costs here I have installed by a diver versus just the materials alone if you want to try to install it yourself um, with a permit. And then mechanical harvesting and hydro raking, you can see the costs here. Um, I included a per acre cost and a, a cost by day. Um, and how many acres you can get through in a day is really subjective based on plant density. And then herbicide treatment, um, you can see $650 to $1,100 per acre. Um, and I'm gonna go through the next few slides quickly so I can leave about five or 10 minutes for questions. Um, I just wanna point out it's never okay to rake or dig all the plants out of your shorefront. Um, cut plants or leave the cut pieces floating in the lake. Um, this, is, this sounds like a crazy one, but I've seen this done. Um, it's not okay to buy herbicide or algicide at a store or online and self-dose the water body. It's very dangerous um, and concentration and type of herbicide really matter and it's best left to the experts. Um, it's never okay to prop dredge or fence dredge a lake bottom. Um, so you can't drive around with your prop in the lake bottom or drag a metal fence behind the boat to, to, clear, the, to clear the plants. This was done in the old days and it's definitely not kosher today. Um, and it's not okay to put sand or other material on the lake bottom or fill in the lake bottom with rocks or other material. And this is all straight from the Wetlands Bureau. Um, some th simple things that you can do to help limit plant growth naturally. Keep the trees on your shoreline. Overhanging canopies from trees will help shade out the vegetation on the lake bottom. Avoid fertilizer on your shorefront. You are basically just fertilizing the lake. Most of the time you need lime because our, our soils are acidic. You don't really need a lot of fertilizer. Um, plus its use is restricted in the near shore zone. Maintain your septic systems. First tier homes should have their septic systems pumped out every one to three years and second and third tier homes every three to five years. That's to help remove some of the nutrients so they don't infiltrate down to the lake and take care of any erosion problems. Um, sediment deposits in the lake can provide uh, more nutrients and good substrate for plants to grow. Here are some resources for your use. The Aquatic Plants and Algae of New Hampshire's Lakes and Ponds is geared specifically to New Hampshire's lakes. Um, lots of common plants that you would expect to find. It is free online at this link. You can pay $5 and get a hard copy if you'd like. This book here, the um, Best Management Practices book, is really good about reading up on ecology and plant management. It's geared more towards invasive species, um, but it's got some real good information in it and you can just link to it. And then if you go online, oop, online, you can probably find any of these books. I think these are really interesting, neat books about lakes and ponds, and they provide a lot of really neat ecology and habitat information that you might find of interest. And then again, here is the link to the DES Lake Mapper for our reports. Uh, when in doubt, if you want an aquatic plant identified and you don't know what it is, just email me a photo. It doesn't take me any time to take a look at it and let you know what it is. And I am glad to help you. Um, you can take pictures of the plants in the lake or take them out of the lake um, as a specimen and put them on a piece of white paper or paper towel um, and put something on there for scale. Take a picture and then just email it to me. Uh, this is a quick tutorial on the DES Lake Mapper. If you use this URL or you type this into a search engine, you will get this map. If you zoom in and you click on a water body, here I clicked on Lake Chikorua, 
this dialog box will pop up. If you are interested in a plant map or a depth map for your lake or water quality data, you want to go to this lake trophic survey report. Most of you will have a few different reports for your lake. You can compare between the years or you can look at the most recent year and you can print maps um, at your leisure. And then lots of other information in this, in this app as well. Uh, if you are interested in plant mapping for your lake, DES does very limited plant mapping these days. Uh, we only do it for our lake assessment program and we only do about 10 lakes a year for that. Uh, you can, like I said, find your historic plant maps in the map mapper, uh, lake mapper. You can also hire a contractor to do plant surveys for you to create an updated map like the ones I showed you. They can do sonar surveys where they can give you a whole lot of other information like lake depth, plant distribution, volume of plants in the water column. And then um, there's a survey called a point intercept survey which is probably more than you'll ever need unless you need it for a specialized project. Um, but they do a detailed grid map of your lake and do points where they sample the plants very intensively. Um, like I said, probably more than you need. Or you can make a project for yourself. Um, use historic maps and plant reference resources to remap the plants in your lake um, by yourself or as a lake association. Um, or as a school project for a kid. Um, it might be a fun thing to do. So that is my overview. Um, I hope that answered a lot of questions about uh, aquatic plants, but also some of the nuances related to the Wetlands Bureau. And I believe I have about eight minutes for questions. So I'm nice. going to here and go back to Andrea. Nice job, Amy. Thank you. Um, Wow, I never heard your cattail pancakes uh, story. I'm going to have to hear that sometime. <laughs> they were good. They were really good. <laughs> well, wow, that was a tremendous amount of information, and I'm so glad we're going to have your slideshow to, to put up. But I'm going to turn it over to Crystal and Jessica to field some of the excellent questions that came in. Woohoo, Amy, that was so informative. You know, I think that I am a plant nerd and that I know a lot about plants, but, you know, then I have the privilege of listening to you with all of your expertise and I still get to learn things. So thank you. Thanks, um, Crystal. We've had a few questions come through uh, about observations people are having on their lakes this summer. And one is um, how they're observing so much more aquatic grass in their lake this year. Um, and they're wondering if that is because of the drought conditions, the warmer weather, more nutrients in the lake, or even potentially, it sounds like they have less milfoil in their lake this season. Could that be contributing mm -hmm. to more plant growth? There could be, yeah. And if you guys all remember back to 2016 when we had a drought year as well, we did see an expansion of native aquatic plants in the lake. A lot of that is due to sometimes near shore, the lake level recedes and some of the, the native plants can creep into the lake bed and grow when there's no water there. But more than likely, it's an aquatic plant that just is going a little wild because it can. Um, with lower water levels, sunlight is gonna penetrate deeper into the water column and create more zone of growth. So you will start to see some of the plants creeping a little bit beyond where they typically do. But I think that because it's short lived, they won't become really well established. And I think that after a good winter, we may see things snap back to normal if water levels go back to normal and we get back into a normal rotation. So it's kind of like a, a mast year when we all of a sudden we get overrun with acorns, but then the next year it's not so bad. <laughs> that, is, that is a perfect analogy, Crystal. Great. Um, this is a really interesting question, and it's funny because it's almost the polar opposite of what we usually get phone calls about. Usually people call us and they're like, hey, I've got all these plants growing in my swimming area. Is it okay if we pull them out? And we reiterate what you've taught to us this evening that, you know, they can snip some native vegetation very carefully without removing the roots, taking lots of care not to disturb sediment and things like that, although we say it's it's really not recommended. Um, but what about planting native plants like pickerel weed or uh, native water lilies to um, introduce vegetation into your water body where it may have been removed in the past or is lacking or is experiencing uh, erosion from wake activity? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. And like I said, that you that is something that you can do without a wetlands permit if you're trying to recreate habitat. I think picking plants wisely is good because if you pick something like a cattail, it may not be well behaved in an area, but pickerel weed is probably an okay one uh, to do. Um, my recommendation for that is do not buy them on the internet. A really good study that talked about, and they, they bought a bunch of stuff over the internet and they put it in buckets and they grew it out. And I think it was something like 85% of what they bought on the internet or in a, in a store that sold aquatic plants had something else with it, a snail, a fish, another plant. It's terrifying. And a lot of those actually had hydrilla with them. So a lot of these plant retailers grow hydrilla to sell it to schools um, for research, looking at cells. So hydrilla is in a lot of that stuff. So if it is something that you wanna do, I would recommend taking plants carefully a couple plants from other parts of the same water body and, and relocating a couple to establish them and then um, go from there, hmm. so, at least in the same system. Very, very interesting. Okay, uh, Jessica, do you wanna ask a couple questions? I know we've had a few more coming in through the chat box. Sure, yes, um, we just had one about um, diver assisted suction harvesting and does that require a permit for removing uh, plants on the lake? So the way that works is the diver assisted suction harvesting program was created for managing state listed invasive species like milfoil or fanwort and it's sort of a permit by notification type of thing so that if the divers are working exclusively on state listed invasives, they do not need to get a permit. They just need to work with me on it and do notifications to me. However, if they do want to be, if people want to hire them to remove natives, a permit is definitely needed. They can't just go in and remove the natives. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. Um, and we have one about water lilies, which um, I actually was wondering as well as I travel through the state and I see different colored water lilies. Um, she, she, Linda noticed that the yellow doesn't bloom the same as the white. Um, is that common or, you know, we're going to see different water lilies lake to lake? Mm -hmm. It is very common. So the yellow water lily is the first one to bloom and it usually is blooming before any other aquatic plant in any lake. Um, so usually uh, around May or early June, you're going to start to see the yellows up and blooming. And then as we get later into June, the whites will start to come up and dominate. You might still see a couple yellows throughout the season, but it's going to be dominated by white later on. Um, the pink water lilies, which are scattered in the state, are not native. Um, so oh. reduced on purpose by somebody. Those are ornamentals. Hmm. So just the yellow and the white are native. That's good to know. I always thought that the pink was like a different phenotype of the, the white water lily. There is one phenotype of the white that has a tinge of pink to it, but it's not the full on pink. Gotcha. And Amy, is there an invasive um, yellow flowering lily pad? Uh, there, yes. And how can we tell the difference between <laughs> the invasive and the native? So the floating heart that I mentioned in the floating plant zone, um, the one that is about the size of a dollar coin, that one has a very thin leaf and it has a little white flower on it. There is an invasive yellow floating heart. That leaf is about the same size, but it's very spongy. So if you stick it between your fingers, it's, it's squishy. And then it has a yellow flower to it. We don't have that one in New Hampshire yet, but it is in Vermont. Um, and then there's a crested floating heart that is also invasive, but that hasn't made its way north yet. It's in North Carolina right now. That one also has a white flower, but the leaves are a little thicker than our native. Our native leaves are very thin. Okay. Um, we have somebody that just wanted to share uh, a story of their lake. They said that they had a big washout last year that brought a lot of silt into their lake. Um, and they had been concerned that they would have a population explosion of plants with all the nutrients brought in by that sediment. And they said, to their pleasant surprise, they did not see a lot of additional plant growth uh, in their lake. Um, but then they followed up with a question about whether or not 
um, you know, a, a shift in the natural communities of, of plants and algae in your lake can become apparent in just one year? Sometimes it can. Uh, I have definitely seen that happen. Plant communities do more often than not change slowly though. Um, it also depends on what type of sediment they had going to the lake. If it was a very gravelly, coarse sediment, it's unlikely to grow a lot of plants. If it was a lot of fine organic silty material, that's a lot better habitat for aquatic plant growth and the roots can get in there a little bit better. So I think that might be more of a factor as opposed to time frame. All right, very cool. Our lakes are so interesting. <laughs> Um, well, right now that takes care of, I think, uh, at least the questions that came in through the chat box, uh, but I, I, you know, we're about eight o'clock right now. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to Andrea. I suppose if anybody has a burning question, you can submit it through the chat box. <laughs> well, yeah, those, those are some great questions. And yeah, it's eight o'clock. Um, so we're going to wrap it up here. Um, again, you will receive, um, thank you for attending this evening. Um, this is just, we're so lucky to have um, experts like Amy willing to share their time and expertise with us. And if you guys know Amy, you can always get in touch with her. Um, and she may even get back to you on, a, you know, a Saturday evening. So if you've got a question or a concern, you know, always feel free to reach out to Amy. Um, so again, in, in a couple minutes, you'll get an evaluation from me in the, in your email. So please do let us know how we did. Uh, please let us know what you, what you want to learn about in the future. And if you haven't registered for next week's session on fisheries, please do. It's going to be great. Um, but before we truly wrap it up, um, Again, I want to thank you, Amy, for spending your time uh, with us this evening and wanted to turn it over to you for any last words. I don't have anything else. I want to thank you all for attending tonight. I hope you're all well. And, you know, feel free to reach out to me anytime. I'm glad to answer any follow-up questions or tangential questions or whatever may come up. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you again. And thank you to my team, Crystal and Jessica, for, for helping put this uh, wonderful evening on. And thank you all for spending your time with us. So uh, again, uh, look for those emails and, and be well. Take care.